first of all, um, a little introduction to um, the Whitehall study for those of you who are not familiar uh, with its structure. Now, of course, the Whitehall study is called that because it's based on civil servants. So it's an occupational cohort and it's um, a selected sample of the population. But of course, it's population scale. People self-select, they choose to go and work in the civil service. And one of the things that's terrific about the civil service is the continuity. You know, you've got people who come into it when they're 20 or 30 or 40, and then they stay in it for the rest of their working life. Um, obviously, some of them move, move out. Um, and, um, uh, you know, we can, we can discuss at length the, the, the um, pros and cons of, of that kind of approach to conducting a study. Um, but one thing which is, which is very nice is that even after 30 years of follow-up, we've got an 80% participation rate among, uh, among those people who remain alive. Uh, so loyalty is, <coughs> is, is the name of the game. So <coughs> this is the root observation that led to the second cohort, to Whitehall 2. And this is one of the first applications, as I understand it, of logistic, multiple logistic regression that was conducted by Martin Shipley, who still works on the study and who at that time um, was working at the London School of Hygiene and he was <coughs> using this amazingly advanced technique called multiple logistic regression which ran on a mainframe um, in, I think it was SPSS. And <coughs> what, what, it, what, um, what Michael Marmot did was to kind of re, you know, re-spin the, the crystal um, and, and switch um, a bog standard cardiovascular epidemiology study established to look at heart disease, respiratory disease and so on by Jeffrey Rose and his colleagues and said, let's, um, let's look at the impact of employment grade on um, the um, future risk of coronary mortality. And so this was the first study and what, what they did was to <coughs> look at the model um, adjusted for age and then, and then throw in the, the, the major established risk factors and um, you know, generated this white space paradox. You know, how come we can't explain the social gradient in incident coronary disease, uh, sorry, incident morta uh, coronary mortality um, by, uh, by this approach. But of course now the statisticians among you will know that um, it was absolutely drop dead obvious why there was so much white space and that's to do with measurement error, it's to do, to do with um, uh, residual confounding uh, and, and so on. So um, that was, a, that was a, a very simple study, which just had a baseline measurement of recruitment of, the, of exposures and then following people up. And, it, and, and I think most of those people, that cohort's probably now dead. They were only men. So um, Michael used that, um, that paradoxical white space, which he said, well, is it because we're not measuring the risk, enough risk factors? Is it because we're not taking into account certain categories of exposure, like the psychosocial, uh, the dietary, and so on? And um, this, this led to the establishment of the second cohort in 1985, which recruited um, 6,800 men and 3,400 women. And that's a ref that was a reflection of composition of the civil service at that time. Now it's, now it's more in gender balance. And what you can see is that this is very similar in its structure to a birth cohort in the sense that you have repeat contacts, 
um, clinical every five years, questionnaire in the intervening period. So as I, as I mentioned, we're in the 31st year of follow-up. Um, in terms of data linkage and sharing, just to flag up what we're doing, we've got infrastructure funding from the MRC to 2023 to share um, not only the Whitehall data, but linked electronic health records from HES, mental health data set, mortality, um, to quote the um, proposal after very careful de-identification. And um, th this, this is where we link up with CLOSER um, and the, the data will, will be going into CLOSER. And the longitudinal data allows us to do things like this, which is to look at trajectories um, in various ways. These are the age trajectories of glycemic traits according to ethnic group. Um, and uh, <coughs> we can see in the case of beta cell function, estimated beta cell function, that we get some really interesting results that we show that although for South Asians, if you did a cross-sectional study, it would suggest that their pancreatic function was way better than white people. What you can see is that as time goes by, um, the pancreatic function of the South Asians really starts to decline and converge. Um, and that gives a, gives a unique insight into the... Um, the diabetes risk in, in, in those ethnic groups. Um, Whitehall 2 has got a massive range of, of health-related outcomes and functioning is a very important one in the context of you know, the challenges of, a, of an aging population. Um, <coughs> this is a recent paper which shows the social gradient in poor physical health, so high, intermediate, low grade, this is poor physical health, this is poor mental health, and the proportions um, at repeated um, measurement periods um, goes between 16 and 26 percent. And then we can see also something that's less commonly measured, which is recovery, and we can see um, social, very strong social gradient in recovery, particularly for poor mental health which is massively socially stratified. Now, a point to make about Whitehall is that um, risk, for, although it's not, as I said, population-based, and that means that the prevalence of exposures and the, and the occurrence of disease and so forth will, will be different from the general population, um, the risk factor effects, <coughs> so, so here, shown by major acute coronary events um, is very, very similar to that seen in a general population sample. This is a British <laughs> regional heart study which is based in primary care. So these, these are the range of risk factors like um, lipids and so forth. So um, to come to the little vignette, the case study um, which um, I thought it might be of interest because it involves using one of the birth cohorts. Um, this, is a, this is a paper that Arch and some of her colleagues did, it, mainly based uh, in, the, in, the, in the Paris office of the Whitehall 2 study. And um, uh, what we did here was to um, go a step further than Michael's um, multiple logistic regression. So what this does is it, it incorporates time-varying exposures. So you've got a multi-record COX model um, with five-year chunks of, of follow-up. And um, what we can do here then is to really, in a way, to replicate or go beyond what, what Michael did back in the 70s um, using um, a more realistic approach to exposure. And to give you, to give you an idea, um, you can see that uh, during the course of the follow-up that's in this analysis, smoking prevalence fell from 10% to 5% in the highest grade, from 30% to 15% in the lower grade. So, you know, relatively speaking, similar. 
Unhealthy diet fell from 6% to 1% in the highest grade, 15% to 5% in the lowest grade. And um, the, so then the white space very much starts to close. And we can see that the gradient in all-cause mortality, um, the attenuation goes up when you, in, the, in the adjusted model from 42 to 72, and for CBD mortality from 29 to 45. But this raise, so the, the, you know, the, the geek, the, you know, the geek issue has been addressed, but this raises then a public health issue which is deeply problematic because if you just look at adult exposures, then, you know, the, then the people at Public Health England and in you know, Conservative Party central office and so on will say, well, you know, it's their own fault. You know, if people die, it's because you know, they're, they're not exercising self-restraint. So how do we address this? Well, you know, this is a familiar argument to people in the room. We need to take a causes of the causes approach. Why is there a social gradient in smoking? Surely life course uh, approach will, will help us. So what we did is we, <coughs> we, we with, a, with a, a great student called Ingrid Giesinger, we, we analysed data from the 46 cohort and we saw the, <coughs> the stratification of um, survival by, by social class, so this is manual, non-manual, um, according to uh, education level, according to home ownership, um, and, and you know, sticking with the smoking issue, what we can see here is that when we stratify by four levels of Registrar General Social Class, we can see um, that at age 20 in the 46, that smoking rates were pretty much unstratified on, on, on by class, but then, then um, as in general the prevalence of smoking goes down, that the gradient emerges. And so we did, um, we did some path modelling and we showed um, that we could partition the effect of smoking on the outcome, which is social inequality in mortality, so the mortality gradient. And we could see <coughs> that almost half of the smoking-related inequality was attributable to, to early life factors. So we can see that there's a path where persistence of smoking is related to socioeconomic circumstances in childhood. We can see also that there's an independent effect of childhood which also explains nearly a quarter of the mortality gradient. And then we see a direct smoking effect. So the direct smoking effect is only 28%. And that, and that um, would be smaller if we'd had a larger range of expo early exposures in the model. Um, <coughs> going, go, so that's, that's my little example of, of the sorts of uh, thinking about health inequalities that we're, we're doing. With, and there are many other dimensions. Then um, there's another aspect to our work, which is policy modelling. So th this, is, this is my attempt to, to explain why epidemiology, as it stands, doesn't have more impact on policy. And that is because we focus on, on you know, estimating betas and policy makers don't give a damn, do they? Policy makers don't want to know what the beta is. You know, if you say to a policy maker, well, we've got a beta of 0.53, you know, they're not going to be very excited. They want to know which policy will have the largest impact. And so what we've done <coughs> is to synthesise the epidemiology that's accumulated over the last 60 years or so 
um, not all of it, of course, but you know, in a, in a focused way to look to see what the burden of disease is, what, the, what, what aging is going to look like in the UK. So we've done this using um, primarily ELSA, ELSA data, the multiple ways of ELSA, and we're forecasting the number of people who have dementia up to 2040 based on synthesis of existing trends um, in terms of the incidence of cardiovascular disease, the incidence of cognitive dysfunction, the incidence of functional impairment. And um, one of the other he key health states in ageing, which is also in our model, is disability. And this is um, about the relationship between social care spending and disability. And what, what we see is that, is that per adult spending decreased by 11% in, you know, in, in the period of austerity up to 2016. It's probably formed by more now. Um, and what's going to happen to the demand for social care among those aged 65? Well, based on, on one or more uh, ADL impairments, what we can see here is that <coughs> the proportion uh, sorry, the, the number of people who will need care will go up by 25% by 2025. Mind-boggling. And we're still kicking the ball down the road. <coughs> Another thing that we're doing <coughs> in relation to um, Mika and other people's Life Path Consortium is to um, compare you know, our paradigm, the social epi paradigm, about capability and so forth, with a more old-fashioned, um, you know, behaviour-focused um, approach to public health. And so what we're doing is we're putting head-to-head -head the policy of extra investment in education with intensified tobacco smoking prevention using the same model to predict the future burden of dementia and disability but this time we're doing it in the UK, in Spain, France, Sweden and Poland. So the results are going to come out very shortly and I can tell you some more about that. Um, to finish, um, one of the things I did in the spring was to go to Amsterdam at the invitation of Johan Mackenbach who is one of the, Europe's most famous social epidemiologist who has contributed a massive amount of evidence on the question of, disability, uh, of, of inequality and various outcomes over the last 40 years or so. <clears throat> and it disturbed me very greatly that the report, which is sponsored by the um, Royal Dutch Academy of Arts and Sciences, plus uh, the Federation of European Academies of Medicine and this Alia All European Academies outfit. Um, <clears throat> he seems to be retreating, very much retreating. Look at his questions. Is there a causal effect of socioeconomic position on health? What mediates the effect of socioeconomic position in health? And, um, you know, there are, there are so many reviews around, there's a massive evidence that comes from UCL or, or IOE, closer and so on. It's, you know, we, have a, we, do, we do have a job to do and that's something we could perhaps return to at the end. Thank you for listening to my bit. Okay, thank you.